This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Welcome to AutoCorrect, helping you correct your auto problems. Our host is Coach Charlie Melton, ASC Certified Master Technician. I'm Liz Gill. Hey, folks, how do you drive? In town or down the dirt road past the paved highway? There are different drivetrains for different conditions, which is best for what? Coach is going to help us know what's a four-wheel drive, what's an all-wheel drive. I don't know. My car's got four wheels, and if it's all-wheel drive in that four-wheel drive, I don't know. But Coach knows. Hello, and Happy New Year, Coach. Well, Happy New Year to you. Glad to be back. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Glad, glad to be here. Hey, okay, so uh, 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 I got to tell, I got to tell my, this is my, uh, each of us can do uh, over the holidays story. So the husband and the kid drive to Arkansas to pick up grandma to bring her home for holidays. That day it was like 12 or it was five or whatever it was. It was like negative two in Arkansas. They're driving the hybrid, the hybrid with the battery that usually gets great gas mileage. So it has a small tank that morning, 22 miles per gallon. And it's got a little teeny tiny tank. So, you know, we've got his Dodge Grand Caravan. It gets 22 miles per gallon, but it has like a 25-gallon tank. This is like a 10-gallon tank. <sighs> well, you look at it, things change when they do the battery. It changes, and you start losing that gas mileage that everybody talks about. Yeah, so, you know, uh, da, 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 I'm just saying. You Tell us a good, uh, do you have a, you have a car Christmas over the, the break story? Well, you know, I did several things over the Christmas holiday and the New Year's as uh, fixing vehicles. Um, I tore one completely down as the whole front end, put it all back together, and it took about a couple of days, and it was cold. I smashed my fingers a couple of times, and you know how when you smash your fingers when it's cold, they never stop hurting. So, but they're okay now. Y'all, folks, safety first. So, folks, be careful. Okay, so... I've got a car, it's got four wheels, but it's not, you know, what, all wheel drive, four wheel drive. Let's, let's just flat off. What's the difference? So we, excuse me. So we talk about it. We have two wheel drive, we have all wheel drive and we have four wheel drive. Okay. Two wheel drive. That means either the front axles are turning or the rear axles are turning and that's it. Okay. All wheel drive means that all four wheels are turning all the time. And then four-wheel drive is when the rear wheels turn all the time and the front wheels are engaged some of the time. So that means that if you're thinking about a four-wheel drive vehicle, it is used in different conditions, slippery situations, mud, snow, gravel, inclines. Those are really what four-wheel drives are used for. Two-wheel drives are your normal driving vehicles. They get good gas mileage. Four-wheel, uh, all-wheel drives, they are all-wheel drive, but they don't get as good as gas mileage, and they are used. Most vehicles are not all-wheel drive. I want folks, when they're listening to this show, you know, if you close your eyes and you picture a four-wheel drive, I'm picturing a Bronco going through the mud or a Jeep going up a hill. And if you're just driving to Kroger... (laughs) That may not be what you need if your aesthetic is to have a big SUV. Uh, 
Can, I, I wonder if you can get an SUV with a two-wheel drive. You can still get them. Uh, but if you think about Jeep, let's go back to when Jeeps were created. That was your first four-wheel drive because four-wheel drives have not been around all that uh, time. But they created the four-wheel drive in the Jeep. And if you notice today, Jeeps are, they are modern looking vehicles now. And a lot of them are four wheel drive. Even the Bronco, the Wagoneer, I mean, the Bronco or the Jeep uh, Cherokee, all of those could be four wheel drive, you know? And so they look different, they look better. And you can't really tell because first of all, you're not going out and you're not turning the front hubs. You know, and if we think about four wheel drives, we had, you, you had to get out of the vehicle, you had to put it in neutral, you had to go out and you had to lock the hubs. That was my job when I was 15 <laughs> for, the, for my dad. <laughs> you would have to lock the hubs. You, if it was wet, wet, rainy or whatever, because that's how much time you're going to use it. So you lock the hubs, you get back in it, you would push the gear shift forward and now you're ready to go. When you got through, when you got back on the pavement, you had to get back out, unlock the hubs, take it out of four-wheel drive, and start again. You know, but there's no longer that way. There are some vehicles that still have locking hubs, but most of them today are all automatic. You don't have to get out of the vehicle, and you can do a lot of it on the fly. And when I say on the fly, that means you can be driving down the road, and you hit a button, and it goes in four-wheel drive for you. Oh, that sounds – so if you have a uh, the kind where you can – lock the hubs or you can just push the button what kind of drive do they have when they're not in four-wheel drive okay that's a two-wheel drive okay, okay so uh if you think about four-wheel drive they always start at two-wheel drive and you're the one who's making it go into four-wheel drive they start rear wheels or front wheels it's just usually the rear wheel drive vehicles and then you push the button it goes in four-wheel drive now when you think about four-wheel drive how does it go from two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive well, you have a transmission uh, that runs the uh, drive drivetrain, and then you have a transfer case. A transfer case, then you have another axle coming off of it, or really a drive shaft coming off it, going to the front, and you're really engaging that drive shaft. And when you engage that drive shaft, that means making it turn, and turn, it turns the front wheels. And then you get all the torque from the engine as well. Really what you're doing on a four-wheel drive, you're putting torque at every single wheel. On a two-wheel drive, you're just putting it on the rear wheels. And if you notice that two-wheel drives, even if you drive in your yard and it's just slightly wet or damp, that those wheels start spinning, well, that's when you're going to need a four-wheel drive so it pulls it on out. So you got a pushing and a pull at the same time. So let's let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about four-wheel drive. Uh, what's the pros of it? Why, why would I want a four-wheel drive vehicle or a vehicle that was capable of four-wheel drive? Well, let's go to the very first thing you said. You want the aesthetic looks of it. Okay, <laughs> all these guys and these girls, they want that truck that's high in the air and that looks nice. Those are four-wheel drives. And a lot of them, do ne they never get off-road. A four-wheel drive is used to get off-road. It's used to be in the mud. It's used to be in the snow or rocks or incline. That is what they're used for. If you're not doing that, you have no reason to have a four-wheel drive. You know, ranchers and farmers, they have four-wheel drives because they're always pulling things. They're always in the mud. They're always doing things. They need four-wheel drives, but these young teenagers today, and I don't think the parents understand, these young teenagers, a four-wheel drive, and higher they get it in the air, more unstable it is. Now, so let's, you know, the the instability, talking about some of the the cons, you know, we're talking about fuel efficiency. How how does it, if the, with the four-wheel drive? Four-wheel drive fuel efficiency is just terrible. You're talking about yours getting 22. These are getting 10 or 12 miles an hour. Okay, I mean, miles per gallon. That is, <laughs> uh, in today's fuel prices, you're going to be filling it up, and they got big fuel tanks as well. Okay. Well, once again, most high school students and college kids get them to look good. But some of those country boys, they go out there in the fields, and they use them for that. If you think about, still, if you go back to the <coughs> – the cons of a four-wheel drive, four-wheel drives are used in situations where the wheels are slipping or you get stuck. If you put them on the pavement at four-wheel drive, 
you're going to mess the vehicle up. You're going to mess the drivetrain up. And when we talk about the drivetrain, you can mess the transmission up, the transfer case. Uh, you can mess a lot of things up and be very expensive if you drive on flat pavement and dry pavement because the wheels can't slip. So that means they're gripping all the time. And then you think about it, you got uh, three modes of four-wheel drive. you got four-wheel high. And four-wheel high is a, just say if you're going through mud and snow and say you're on a wet surface and it is the highway, you're told to go no more than 55 or less, and that's in the four-wheel high. Then you got four-wheel low, and four-wheel low is like it's just barely creeping along, okay? It's pulling. That's where more torque is going to the front wheels. You should never, ever get on front on pavement with that one because then you just mess up everything. And then there's one called automatic. Okay, automatic four-wheel drive is that you push the button, you put it in automatic, and the it has sensors that will sense when it needs to go in four-wheel drive. So if you're driving on dry pavement and you're just say you're going to the mountains and you come up and you're getting a little higher and then you run into snow, you have it in automatic, automatically four-wheel drive engages for you and you do nothing well that's oh I, i'm loving this conversation it it brings me back it reminds me of my dad if you've got a question or you've got a comment we would love to get your information just email us auto at mpbonline.org we're talking about drive trains but we're also taking your repair questions is your car under recall I'll tell you some that are next. You are listening to AutoCorrect with Coach Charlie Mountain. I'm Liz Gill. If you want even more AutoCorrect, find our podcast on all podcasting platforms for your smart device. AutoCorrect is heard on MPB Think Radio, Thursdays at 10 a.m. with a replay Saturdays at 11. Okay, so here are some recalls. Chevy Bolt EVs are being recalled, but for a new and different fire risk. Here we go, Jay. Seat belt pretensioners may ignite carpet fi uh, fibers causing a fire. So those exploding seat belts could cause a fire. So but these don't explode. They just cause other things to yeah, catch fire. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, but with this Chevy Bolt EV, you don't have to park outside. You know, some of those, when they have a recall, they say, don't charge it overnight. Don't park it in the garage. Um, VW is adding the 2015 through 16 Beetles to the list of the Takata affected uh, oh, vehicles. And uh, Mercedes Benz sedans are being recalled for a detaching moonroof. I'm like thinking of driving and it pops, pops off like, like a sail or something. I don't know. So for uh, 2022, Ford was the most recalled automaker of the year with 67 recalls affecting over 8 million vehicles. That is 22 more recalls over Volkswagen, who had the second most number and 5 million more vehicles than Tesla, which was second in vehicles. So anyway, you can find out if your car has a past recall by going to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's website, NHTSA, NHTSA.gov slash recall. Just put in your VIN or find their Safer Car app. We're talking about drivetrains, four-wheel drives, all-wheel drives. What's the difference in the drives? But we're also taking your vehicle repair questions. That email address is auto at mpbonline.org. But it's a call-in show. We've got some phone calls. Let's go to Starkville and talk with Rion, uh, thanks for calling into AutoCorrect today. What's going on? Oh, oh, hey, Liz, hey, Coach. I hope you're having a good day today. Um, I'm call I'm calling today. I, I wanted to get y'all last week, but uh, the, the deal was part everything that was going on last week cut y'all show off. But I, uh, I'm a, I'm a, a great uh, listener like everyone else. But I sent an email in last year around October the 26th, and I believe it was Coach's anniversary. But at the time, I didn't know it was anniversary when I was show. And I actually became a subscriber that day. But I sent in an email, and I, the first thing I want to say to listeners, when you send in an email, Liz is such a great reader, and she's reading your word perfectly as you put it down. And you've made me realize that I, what I put down is what <laughs> I didn't mean. I was, I was putting out the wrong uh, questions out there. So thank you for that, for uh, waking, me, waking my mind up on when you send it in, what you're trying to say. So uh, basically, and uh, 
I got a 2017 um, Toyota Yaris. I, I'm, a, I'm a Chevy guy, and I'm used to those type of vehicles, but I'm learning a lot about Toyotas. You know, like everything is more expensive, but they last longer. But anyway, I, I had to replace a rear wheel hub on the uh, back driver's side. And you probably remember this once I get into the detail of it. But when I changed up, and like I said, Coach, you answered the question to my email. But it, once I realized I was trying to keep my email short, I left out a lot of detailed information. Uh, but anyway, I replaced the um, the hub myself because the uh, dealership was going to cost charge me like six fifty or something like that just to get the same part. But once I replaced the rear hub and took out the old manufacturer off that Toyota, I realized that my ABS uh, terminals connector did not match up with the rear, rear hub. So I went around to O'Reilly's and everywhere, and everybody was pulling up the exact same new manufactured part that I bought and not the original part that come off the car itself. So I ended up finding a guy that was pretty familiar with Toyotas at O'Reilly. And he, he went and he did a research all the way back to like 2001, and he said his only conclusion is that that car was probably made over in China, and that was the original part that was made, and that's the reason why I cannot find um, the, the, the right rear right rear uh, hub to match my up uh, because the terminals are completely different. So I, I just kind of figure out, you know, before you, I used to listen to Scotty Killer, but, like, you the guy. Thank you. Uh, Let me explain to you about these hubs and these parts on these vehicles. Now, on the VIN number, you got that 17 digit VIN number there. Okay. Each one of those digits means something to the manufacturer of that vehicle. It tells you where the vehicle was manufactured, if it was manufactured in America, Japan, or China, wherever it was. It's going to tell you where it was manufactured, and it's going to tell you the date it was manufactured. The problem is is that vehicles today, what they do on these vehicles, they start a new year come September. Okay, When they start that new year, you'll see all these uh, 2023s come out, and it's still 2022. Okay, so all these different vehicles come out at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. If they have a problem during the manufacturer year, they will change a part on that vehicle. Even though it's a 22, it may have a 23 part on there. Okay, because okay. they were having problems with it and they changed in the middle of the manufacturing year. Okay, so the manufacturing year is not January to January. It is September to September. And if you notice, they always have a lot of vehicles left at that time that they're trying to get rid of. So what you need to do, that VIN number you have, you need to go to the manufacturer, let them look that VIN number up, and they will tell you exactly which one goes on that vehicle. Now, you don't have to buy it from the manufacturer, but you know if you know the dealership, or the Toyota dealership, if you know anybody, they will give you that part number, and then you can find exactly what you want. Because the okay. manufacturer oh. has to, they're going to go by that VIN number. That's all they're going to go by. They're not, because uh, that VIN, that 17 VIN number, the last six or seven digits is like the serial number of the car, but everything from the, the, from the left to the right, the first 10 tells you everything about that car, model, make, year, where it came from, when it was manufactured, what plant it was manufactured in. Okay. Okay. So I need I need to check that out. I mean, because you know them hubs are not cheap. Well, you can get them on market, but you know. I, and then I think they I think they told me just to change out the the ABS line was like two fifty or something like that. You know, and I just. I can't do all that. Yeah, because you have to re- be rewiring and stuff like that, and then that wiring may not be the same thing as the computer. So you need to go by that VIN number, and that should help you. Okay. Okay. And uh, I so sure appreciate it. And my my other question is that I asked. I had asked about the uh, temp sensor, like um, these newer models. You know, they like I'm used to the gauges. Like you can look at your temp and you could see where your gauge, your, your your temperature is running. But like these newer ones, it's just that like my, my mechanic buddy, he called it a dummy light. But, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that light comes on, and I call it an idiot light. So it's too late when that light comes on. You know. Right, right. But well, when, what would be a good a go, good idea to like? Because I, I looked at the gauge like you told me uh, in the emails last year, 
and I looked it up, and it's just it's too much of a hassle to install that thing, like in in the dash, and you know. So I I figured I'd go another route, but if that light just pops on like that, is, is it really too late? <laughs> well. If it just pops right, on I, and you cut that vehicle off, it's not too late. But if you're driving that vehicle with that light's on, well, now you're going to burn the car up, you know. Right. And that temperature is going to get up to about 180 to 210 degrees. Uh, anything over 210 degrees, that light's going to pop on, you know. So if you're not getting, if that light's not popping on, you're not running hot. Okay. Okay. And I, I sure appreciate it. Like everybody tell y'all, y'all know y'all hear it all the time. I, I love the show. And like, if you ever heard of Scotty Kilmer, uh, he's he's a uh, I think he's a master uh, technician as well. But he does a lot of YouTube videos. But ever since I got acquainted to y'all show, I don't listen to Scotty anymore. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, y'all have a happy New Year's, y'all. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's go to Olive Branch and talk with Ronnie. Ronnie, we're glad you've called into Autocorrect today. What's your comment or question? I've got a uh, um, an S550 2003 bucket truck with a front wheel, you know, with a four wheel drive in it, and they're mechanical that you can turn them in. One side turns real easy. The other one, I actually have to use a pair of pliers to use it to turn. Is that thing easily replaceable, or is it something that I've got to uh, put in a shop and let them pull everything off to get that uh, lever to be changed? Well, what I would do on that one there first, you know, if the other side's easy, it does it have, like, uh, Allen screws around the cap on the front where you turn it? No. At this point, I'm not sure. Okay, it has some types of screws that hold that cap on where the uh, switch is that you turn it. You could remove that yeah. cap off there, and then you can remove the switch uh, where you turn it. And most likely, either it's just got full of crud and dirt and mud in there that you could probably pull yeah. that out and clean it with some good brake cleaner or some type of cleaner that you could get all that out and see if that will be able to move. Because it it's not real hard to change those. You're not changing in the inner part of it you're just changing really the outer part that moves because really that's all you're turning is the outer part where you're switching it in to go into gear you know you're not switching okay. it in the transfer or the differential all you're doing is switching it on the outside okay that makes sense i was thinking something similar but it's nothing in electrical it's all a mechanical system yeah. that i have and one other question with that same truck we were taking it to go do a job and it just shut down on Pulled over and sat there a few minutes. It cranked up and moved down the road a little bit. Cranked, cranked and moved a little bit and it shut down again. Could that be more than likely the fuel filters need replacing? Is that diesel or gas? This one. Yes, sir. It's diesel. Yes, sir. It yeah. Is. Yeah. What I would do there, you know, that uh, has a water filter on there. I would drain that. Uh, what size engine does it have? A five of uh, what is that? A seven up. three or six zero? Yeah, it yeah it probably has a water filter on there. I would change that. Uh, go ahead and see if it's that filter is too full of water, and you may have to just change that filter itself. Well, I, I, if I change one, I'll change them both. Yeah, change both of them. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time and help. You've Thank you so much. A lot of help. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Ronnie. See, this is why I love this show. I have no idea but about anything those last two calls said, <laughs> but you helped them. You made their day. Hopefully save them some money because, you know, like as Rion said, it's expensive if you take it to the dealer. But if you can do it yourself, that's great. But I have no idea. But hey, 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 yesterday I changed the headlamp in my Dodge Grand Caravan. You did good. I went and bought the new light. Um I just told him what kind I had. They looked it up, and he even said, uh, you know, you can buy one or you could buy two in case, you know, uh, it's cheaper if you buy two. So I'm sticking the extra one in the glove box in case the other one goes out soon. But I just removed a couple of screws, pulled the headlamp out, did a little rotate, pulled it out. Stuck the new one in, didn't touch the, the bulb. bulb. That's it. I was going to ask you uh, that question. Yeah. Stuck it back in, rotated it back, stuck it back in, did the screws. You know, the hardest part, and this is my problem with my husband, is like looking down. <laughs> Especially if wearing glasses. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it was a 
$26 fix rather than 80 125 or whatever at the dealership. And, folks, if I could do that, anybody could do that. A little mechanical ability. Yeah, just having the empowerment to okay. try to try. do it yourself. And if you can't do it yourself, then you get somebody to fix your mistake. Then you call somebody else. That's it. <laughs> Let's get Regina in before our break. Regina from Jackson, what's your comment or question for Coach? The Jeeps used to be really reliable, and I have been seeing a lot of negative reviews in the past couple of years about them, that they're not the quality that they used to be. Do you have any opinion on them, or is it a certain style or whatever? But I see people with them, but I heard they have a lot of problems. Well, this is my opinion. It's just my opinion. It's nobody else's. I don't like working on Jeeps. This is my – I never have because of the – mechanical part of it but you know jeeps are no longer american made they're some they may be made or assembled in america but they're no longer american made uh owned company they're owned by renault and uh by being owned by a foreign country they have changed the parts of a jeep for the manufacturers believe it or not a jeep used to have a American Motors engine, used to have a Ford engine, a Chevrolet engine, and it even had a Mercedes engine in it. And so it has done a lot of transformation on it. So just, you know, you, you're going to get a lemon every now and then, but, you know, that's just my opinion on Jeeps. Uh, I know, but you, you you don't like working on them. So you, you, you what truck or uh, what uh style, not SUV, but whatever. What, what classification is Jeep in? Is it an SUV or what? It could be an SUV. It could be a crossover. It could be either one of them. Uh, what, is Toyota the best vehicle or Nissan? Oh, I'm not gonna Japanese s- outpaced us in quality? Well, I couldn't tell you that which is the best vehicle because all of them have a different quality in them. It's according to what you're looking for, what standards you're looking for, because all of them are good vehicles. And like I said, you're going to get a lemon every now and then. I'm not saying that uh, you couldn't get one with uh, Nissan or Toyota because I've seen where Nissan had a recall that had to recall a lot of vehicles because of the transmission and radiator. So there's a lot of different things out there. Okay, dokie, thank you. Yeah, Regina, you just need to look at how you drive, where you drive, who you're hauling, what's your aesthetic. Uh, what's your pocketbook? That's uh, it. You know, I, I I guess I've taken some of those quizzes. <laughs> you know, which kind of car is the best for you? Um, I, I think you know every single person has a different uh, thing that they're doing. You know, are you hauling dogs? Are you hauling kids? Are you hauling restaurant equipment? Uh, are you just driving to work? Are you driving to work fifty miles away? Everything all depends. That's what they say on in legal terms. It depends. And Everything all depends on your situation. And everybody has a different style. They have a different preference. So it just, like uh, Liz said, just do your research and just see what you like out there. But good luck with that, Regina. We're so glad that you called in today. Our email address where you can send questions is auto at mpbonline.org. We are learning about front wheel, rear wheel, All-wheel drives, but that's just between your repair questions. What's in the news? I'm going to tell you next. Thank you for listening to AutoCorrect on MPB Think Radio. Coach Charlie Melton, retired instructor from Clinton's High School Automotive Technology Program, is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill. I hope that you have downloaded our app for your smartphone, the MPB Public Media app. You can listen to our show anywhere in the world on the app. But more importantly, you can make a contribution. It's contributions from listeners. We are publicly supported radio, and we need the public to contribute. So hit that support button, and uh, thank you so much for your contributions to Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Autocorrect is heard on MPB Think Radio Thursdays at 10 a.m. with a replay Saturdays at 11. Okay, as our first caller mentioned, we didn't get to have a show last week because the president was talking. So I'm using our script from last week, and I have last week's news, but it's still this week's news. That's right. Doesn't have anything to do with cars, 
but there was no Mega Millions jackpot winner, and it was closing on a billion dollars last week. Today, I have just pulled it up, one point three billion dollars. All right, I gotta go get my ticket. You gotta get your ticket because the drawing is Friday. So Jay White, I'm gonna ask you to coach if you could buy a vehicle, anything. With your billion dollars, what would you buy? Wow. I'd probably go buy me a the most expensive Land Rover vehicle mm-hmm. they got. Like Land Rovers. That's like the things the queen and the king drives. Those things like last decades and decades and they decades. Do. They do. How about you, Jay White? What would you what vehicle would you buy? Because this is autocorrect. Everyday sure. tech, you could buy your own tech thing, but right. uh, autocorrect, what would you buy? Nineteen eighty five Toyota SR five pickup. Oh, yes. okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. My first car. Uh huh. I Excellent. know where you, and it's probably still running somewhere. <laughs> hey, I, I know where you I, can I get one. I did my best to stop it, but it's probably still running somewhere. I know yes, where you. I know where you can get one. Where's that? Eighteen thousand dollars. Well, that's the thing. Well, right, see, yeah, but, right down from my house. <laughs> really? That's right. Okay. They've we'll had talk two later. Of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, like. I mean, after after the rapture, there's going to be roaches in those 1985 Toyota pickups. Okay. <laughs> roaches will be driving those pickups. That's right. <laughs> and that's all. That's all. That's all that'll be left. They were just strong. Yeah. yeah, I think I would buy like a little tiny coupe Miata kind of Fiat. Uh, my my family lives in the mountains of Arkansas, and uh, my first car, my first new car, was a little tiny car, and we'd drive around the mountains, and I think that's kind of fun. Yes. <laughs> Every, there's a car for everybody. For everybody. Today we're talking about drivetrains, four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, front wheel, rear wheel. Email us your questions, auto at mpbonline.org. Let's go to uh, Lewis. In Mobile. Lewis, we are so glad you've called in. Uh, Bob is from Mobile, too, but Lou, we're going to go with Lewis first. We love our Mobile, our Alabama listeners. Lewis, what's going on with you today? I have a 2021 uh, Ford Escape hybrid vehicle, and um, about a year ago, we took it into the dealership and had the tires rotated per the service plan. And since then, there has been a noise that it makes. Once the car has set for a while, you know, come home, sit it in the driveway, and then if you go to leave, put it in reverse, it makes a noise that sounds like the brakes are squealing, it makes the metal-on-metal metal squealing sound. Um, and it, it did it, you know, just here and there to start out with, and I thought maybe, you know, it was the brakes, and they, it would just wear in, and it's progressively gotten worse to where it does it every time we move the car now. And we took it to the dealership. They said that it's not the brakes. They couldn't replicate the sound, and they don't know what to tell us. Well, on a situation like that, the first thing, they removed the wheels. And when you had them rotated, they removed the wheels. And a lot of times what happens in the technician, this is terrible, but they have a backing plate on where the brakes are. Uh, and what happens, they bend that backing plate a little bit. And when they bend that backing plate, the rotor will hit that backing plate and it may not hit it all the time, you know, or it may do, it may start all the time, but what, what they do, they bend that backing plate and it's so close to that rotor. If that rotor has any movement whatsoever, it's going to hit that piece of metal. Okay. And it's very easy to fix. All they do is just pry it back and push it away from the rotor. You know, uh, I would check that and then I would check and see. Uh, I don't know what type of emergency brake that has. If it has a brake a hub with the brake inside the rotor or is it uh, on the outside? But if it's on the inside, that brake shoe could have collected a lot of dust and uh, in there. And they just really need to remove the rotor and clean up the inside where the brake shoes are. You know, so that's what I would do. Because there's okay. nothing else that can touch back there. If it's it, the only things that can touch is the brakes, the backing plate, or on the inside where dirt or something could have been lodged up in there. So you're thinking maybe they did all that, and then it's just not making the noise when they put it back together. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. You know, that they might have just bent the uh, rotor, uh, not the rotor, the backing plate of the rotor. It's a very thin piece of metal. 
you can you can push on it with a finger and it'll it'll bend. You know, so it's very thin and that could happen. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Good luck, Lewis. Uh, take it back and see if they can fix it one more time. That's you, right. you you encourage people to have the service people try to fix their mistakes? Oh, yes. If you paid for it and if it's in their service plan, take it back to them because that's what you paid them for. Even if you paid it uh, up front, they still owe you that service. All right. Let's stay oh, in they, Mobile. They still have the car. Yes. They, that, they, just, they, they let me know that they didn't. They couldn't replicate the noise. Um, they still have the vehicle. They, I haven't picked it up yet. Well, you know, a lot of, and I hate to tell you, there's a lot of technicians, just like anybody else that makes a mistake, they don't like to own up to their mistake. And so they might have just pushed the piece of metal back and say, hey, that was it. And now they can't replicate the noise because they found it right off. You yeah. Because it's so easy to do and without even trying, it's easy to do. So maybe maybe Lewis could drive it around the uh, the dealership when yeah, and they see pick, if it's when fixed now. It yeah, yeah. It, 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 may, right. it's probably, it may be fixed now because, you know, they're not going to tell you they bend it and push it up against the rotor because that makes them look what well, they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, well, good luck, Lewis. Let's stay in Mobile and go to Bob. Bob, thanks for calling in to AutoCorrect today. What's your comment or question? Um, well, just listening to what you said, I'd have to say that my biggest pet peeve is when I take my car into the shop and when I bring it back, I have to fix their work. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing is uh, it's pronounced Renault. Renault. Renault, not Renault. So, so. Yes, yeah, Renault. It's French. It's French. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I've got one, you know, front wheel drive. I've got one of these sideways engines in the RAV4, and I have to take out the, um, the idler pulley because it sounds like chalks on a fingernails on a chalkboard. And um, you have to jack the thing up and take the motor mounts off and all this garbage. And my question is, when do you use anti-seize on the threads, and when do you use Loctite? Well, you know, if there is something, just say if you're going to use, uh, let's say, Loctite. If, you're, if there's something that's not going to be removed, and the manufacturers use a lot of that on boats that are they use, they, you know, there's two different sizes or three different uh, strengths of Loctite, okay? And they'll use the blue, the red, uh, I think there may be an orange. And they use those uh, different strengths of Loctite according to where they're putting the boat at, okay? And that means those boats are not going to come out very often, okay? And that's why they put the Loctite on. Anti-seize, really what you're trying to do on anti-seize, just say if you had aluminum still going into aluminum, Okay, it corrodes. Okay, when it corrodes, you can't yeah. get that boat out. So that's where I would put uh, some type of graphite or something in there. Okay. Normally, I put that on my wheel logs when I put bolts on there. Uh, that's the same yeah, that's thing. Uh, because, like I say, uh, uh, let me give you a good scenario. What I had this week, I put a starter on a Honda. And I pulled the manifold, and I went down and got the bolts out of the Honda, and the one on the bottom of that Honda starter is about four inches long. Okay, I had to get a two-foot, half-inch ratchet to turn that boat out because the center of the threads took every thread out of the aluminum. Once again, a steel bolt to the aluminum. Okay, well, there is no way that starter has never been taken out before. But it got corroded inside of the part, uh, inside of the engine. Well, you had to get it out. I spent more time taking that boat out than I did taking the starter and putting it on. So, wow. <laughs> think about that. Uh, last thing, last thing. If I win the lottery, I'm going to pay somebody else to fix my 14 year old Rav Four. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Best wishes, buddy. Thank Take you, buddy. Care. Thank you, Bob. We are discussing drive tains and taking your repair questions. You can send us an email to auto at mpbonline.org. We've got a new car review from Casey Williams coming up. It's a Mercedes. I'm not a 80. I'm not a 90s baby in a 80s Mercedes. <laughs> but I'm always I'm it just always surprises me how many people drive Mercedes. Good good for you. Live live your best life. This is AutoCorrect on MPB Think Radio. Until recently, if you wanted an efficient mid-sized Mercedes, you had to buy a diesel. But that all changes with the 2023 Mercedes EQE 350 4Matic that we have this week. This is the electric mid-sized sedan. It looks the part on the outside, super sleek, super aerodynamic, and absolutely beautiful. 
Inside, all the Mercedes luxury you'd want, but 21st century luxury. Flat screen instrument cluster, large infotainment touchscreen, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, Burmester Audio, and of course a panoramic sunroof. But underneath the skin it gets interesting. So this has lithium ion batteries, twin motors for the all-wheel drive, and 288 horsepower. Goes 0 to 60 in 5 and a half seconds. Driving range, looking about 240 miles. You can do 10 to 80% recharge on a fast charger in 30 minutes or overnight in your home charger. So a very nice car, very efficient, and very quick. So let's talk about price. Well, the EQE starts at $74,900. This one, $77,900. This is AutoCorrect. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show from our website, autocorrect.mpbonline.org. AutoCorrect is heard on MPB Think Radio Thursdays at 10 a.m. with a replay Saturdays at 11. Stay tuned after the show at 11 a.m. at Southern Remedy Kids and Teens with Dr. Morgan McLeod. I'm Liz Gill, but our expert is Coach Charlie Melton, ASC Certified Master Technician and Birthday Boy. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Yay! Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 31. Yes, 31 <laughs> plus 31. <laughs> It is time for Coach Charlie's tip of the week. You know, we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, we're talking about four-wheel drive uh, vehicles. Make sure you go to the manufacturer's uh, website or the owner's manual. Make sure you look at what it says, when to operate that four-wheel drive, when not to operate it, if it's in mud, if it's on dry pavement. Just go to the manufacturer's uh, owner's manual and look at that. Great. Let's go to Gulfport. Oh, I love Gulfport. Let's go to Teresa. Teresa, what's your comment or question for Coach? Oh, well, happy birthday, well, thank and uh, you. thank you for your service on this show, because it's been so helpful. I have a 2011 Camry, and I just took it to the dealership, and they came back and said that I need to uh, have a since my transmission, my brake, and my power steering fluid flush. And it does not say that in the owner's manual, and I've never heard of that. Okay, let me go back and tell you what they do. Okay, a... A dealership makes their money off service. Uh, they do sell That's cars. Mm -hmm. They make their money off service. And, you know, if they can sell you a flush, you know, a lot of manufacturers did uh, in the owner's manual tell you to flush your brake system out because what happens, brake system, uh, brake fluid absorbs water. And so when we used to have a uh, metal steel parts, well, they get, they would rust, and so they wanted you to flush them, okay? As of the transmission, you know, I'm not a big proponent of it. The manufacturer does say change it, but uh, sometimes you uh, leave things better left alone if nothing's wrong with it, you know? So you want to be okay. careful of what you do. Uh, I've, Toyota's really not had a problem with that, but I know the Honda did and Ford did and Chevrolet did. Uh, so you want to be careful, you know, on changing transmission fluid, uh, especially it's 2011. How many miles you got on it? 90,000. Um, I probably wouldn't worry about it yet myself. But uh, just okay. look and see what the menu says, the owner's manual says. If it doesn't say that service in it, don't worry about it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thanks, Teresa. Let's wrap it up with a little bit more of our four-wheel drive, front-wheel drive uh, conversation. So we talked a bit about the four-wheel drive. That's kind of hard on your tires, right? It will wear those tires out, those guys, those young men and young women that get those big old tires on there. And they do not follow the uh, manufacturer, and they drive them on flat roads and dry surfaces, and it eats those lugs off those tires. So... I'm not saying if you need a four-wheel drive, you shouldn't get one, but when is it good to have an all-wheel drive vehicle? All-wheel drive is if you're driving in snow and you're driving in rain and you're driving stuff like that constantly, it's good to have all-wheel drive because it pushes the torque to those front wheels as well. And a lot of all-wheel drive has sensors on it, you know, as well for those wheels, but Mainly in the south, and, you know, we need two-wheel drive vehicles unless you're going through the mud and you're going deer hunting, you're doing, and you're just four-wheeling. Then you get your four-wheel drive vehicle and you have fun. Not saying that you don't need one because you want one. Hey, buy one, have fun, just be careful and know what you're getting. And, you know, the, the, the two-wheel drive, just because it's not fancy, doesn't mean that's not what's best maybe for you or for in Mississippi. 
Sure, you know, um, up north and uh, out making Mississippi, Brooksville, all those where they've got dirt roads and stuff like that, then you're going to need those four-wheel drives. But those two-wheel drives, if you're driving around Jackson, Mississippi, Oxford, Mississippi, you need that two-wheel drive, and that's going to save you a lot of money, not only in fuel, but the components to fix that vehicle as well. This is where, you know, parents... I'm not even going to get into parenting and buying what you need. But, you know, think about aesthetic versus pocketbook and what's going to be needing replaced. And insurance costs you more on a four-wheel drive than it does a two-wheel drive. There you go. That's going to wrap us up for today's AutoCorrect. It's been a great one, Coach. Enjoyed you. Our crew, our our pit crew is uh, Jay White, Charles Arnold, and podcast producer Jermaine Flood. Jermaine, Jermaine is great, everybody. Thank you, Coach Charlie Melton, Master Technician. I'm Liz Gill. Thank you so much for listening to AutoCorrect on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.